So I, I wanted to start by just acknowledging to everybody that, that you guys actually have, have a friendship that yeah. goes back quite a ways. Yeah, it goes back to the classroom, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which is so wonderful to uh, have you both here now. Uh, and I wanted to ask, um, put you on the spot a little bit, what is something that you each have learned uh, from the other? Because I know that, that you have come into contact uh, even in later years. Um, uh, and I wanted to ask uh, about what you've learned from each other, but also about the process of, of, uh, of practicing that sort of hospitality, sort of taking in lessons from other people. And uh, uh, do you have any ideas about, about that? Some reflections? Oh, what I've learned from Laura Smith? Yeah. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, uh, it's a story that I often tell, a wonderful occasion. Okay. Laura, Laura graduated from Calvin Theological Seminary was allowed to appear before the Synod of the Christian Reformed Church, which did not ordain women at the time, to make a case why she, as the best preacher at the seminary and all the rest, uh, should be ordained. And they, gave, they did two things. They gave her a standing ovation, and they voted against her. Uh, <laughs> and so then she sought uh, ordination in the Presbyterian, in the PCUSA. But uh, many years later, uh, we were at a conference in uh, Alabama at Beeson Divinity yeah. School, hmm. and it was, a, a, it was on ecumenism, but it was a rather conservative group. They were all uh, uh, Southern Baptists, Roman Catholics, because Father Richard Newhouse was hmm. one of the key speakers, and, uh, and, and people from the Presbyterian Church in America, the PCA, which does not ordain women as well. And I was one of the speakers, Father Newhouse uh, and, and Laura. And Laura was invited by Timothy George, the dean there, uh, to uh, talk about uh, the question of the ordination of women as an ecumenically divisive issue. And uh, she was standing before a rather uh, hostile crowd, or at least the crowd that was negative. And, and I will never forget the wonderful talk that she gave. And she said, I want to tell you, I, I, I'm called, I believe I'm called by God to be unordained. Many of you will disagree with that. But that's a secondary theological issue. And we can argue about that. And I'd be glad to argue. And I'll argue about it as long as you want to argue about it. But here are the primary theological issues. The full divinity of Jesus Christ, the full authority of Scripture, the atoning work of Christ, the second coming of Christ. Those are non-negotiables for me. And if we can agree on those things, then we can talk about who should be ordained under the authority of God's word and under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. I just thought that was a, I, first of all, that was a wonderful thing to say to that crowd. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I was so proud of her. And, and I learned something about uh, making your case. This is one thing that I, I, I got so many years ago from John Perkins as well. Uh, he made room for white evangelicals, mm. and he stuck with us, and he was willing to uh, argue with us, he, uh, but, but it was all under the authority of God's word. And uh, if we were going to defend practices that had clear touches of racism and injustice, uh, we had to uh, make our case in the light of God's word. And I'm so grateful for Laura and John Perkins and others in my life who've taught me what it's like uh, to disagree under the authority of God's word and in the service of, uh, of being a representative of the word of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Laura? Uh, well, I've got uh, several rich mouth stories. I'm trying to pick one. Um, I think that I've been especially um, impressed by how Rich has been involved in the Mormon Christian dialogue and uh, the generosity that, that you show to, uh, to Mormons while still um, being really clear about what's what. Um, and it's changed how I think about uh, interactions with Mormons. Um, because of Rich, I went to a, a, a conference and represented Presbyterianism at, a, at Brigham Young University at a conference mm. about uh, the atonement. You got me into that, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I started to get to know some of the same people that he gets to know, and um, there's, there's a conversation that needs to happen there, and I had not been very open to that conversation before. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rich, you, you brought up uh, a term, uh, ecumenism. Uh, in, in that concept uh, of, of sort of finding common ground, I wanted to ask you, um, there is an ecumenical, uh, 
mission within Christianity, and then there's this broader uh, vision, right? And I just want to ask, um, when it comes to hospitality and being hospitality to those we disagree with within the church, what can we focus on as commonalities, uh, and, and what, are, what are some like common core uh, elements? Clearly, those, there's those doctrinal issues that are just non-negotiable, but some of the other, uh, you might say, handles to, to, to hang on to. And then the same, same beyond the church, when we're in conversation uh, with those, that we still need to have some level of unity, some level of cooperation with. Yeah. Well, I, I think as we debate within the church on one of the most controversial issues of, of the day, uh, sexuality issues, um, I talked to a Presbyterian pastor a number of years ago, and uh, we got into an argument because he and I disagreed on same-sex uh, issues of uh, ordination and, and marriage. And I said, well, how do you interpret Romans 1? And he said, I don't even read Romans 1. I can't stand Paul. I never preach on Paul. Paul is wrong about a lot of things. Uh, that's very different than I mentioned my good friend Barbara Wheeler, who, with whom I've had debates all, all over the Presbyterian denomination on this. And uh, if I ask her, what do you do with Romans 1, she'll say, let's open the scriptures and look at it. Mm -hmm. And she and I have dis uh, different, di different interpretations, but it's an interpretation under the authority of God's word. And uh, when it's, a, when it's an, an argument about whether there is a word from God that is... Uh, supreme authority in our lives, that's a very different argument within the Christian community than the argument about how we understand uh, the Word of God. Uh, the, the Mormon case is an interesting case um, as we move outside of traditional uh, Christianity, because if we had begun 15 years ago, we've just finished 15 years of very uh, frequent and lengthy dialogue. Uh, if we had begun by just saying to them, what about Joseph Smith and uh, uh, arguing that he, he plagiarized the Book of Mormon or something. But instead, we decided to focus on the question, how does a human being get right with God? And what's the worldview there? And Mormons have this strange thing that they say that God and man, this is their language, God and man are of the same species. I find that deeply offensive as a, a traditional, certainly as a Calvinist, you know, the great gap between creator and creature. Uh, mm -hmm the gap to being, which they deny. But the more we talked about it, the more, more I came to realize that Mormonism comes out of a, a reaction to New England Calvinism at the same time as you had Ralph Waldo Emerson talking about transcendentalism, you had Mary Baker Eddy talking mm -hmm. about God and human beings are all part of some grand mind, uh, spirit. And, and in each case, they were trying to bring God closer to us against the background of a Calvinism with whom I agree deeply on, on fundamentals, but it was a Calvinism that often has such a distant God and had such a huge gap. And, they, and, and these folks were trying to bridge the gap ontologically, but they were pointing to the fact that we had created a gap spiritually between ourselves and God. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and once we get into that, it's a very different conversation, and it's a very productive conversation, because we're talking about what it means to have a, a, a proper relationship to the God, with the God who sent Jesus Christ into the world, and that's an important conversation to have. Yeah. Now, no doubt, like, talk, having conversations like that, long, lengthy ones, um, for people who, don't, who, who aren't used to that kind of thing, it can be... A, a scenario where there's lots of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of insecurity around, around that. We, we don't normally gravitate uh, to conflict like that. We, um, and so, and, and fear came up in, in some of what yeah. you were saying, Laura. Yeah. And the idea of, of inviting these foreign, these foreign ideas, strangers, foreigners, so to speak, um, into one's home into, and, and create some space for them um, that has the feeling of uh, just heaping danger on yourself. And I just wanted to ask you both to, mm -hmm. to comment on that. Maybe, Laura, you could start. Well, and, and there is sometimes real danger. I mean, if you're a pastor and you uh, start reaching out to your Mormon neighbors in a way that looks like they're soft on Mormonism, you might pay for that in your church. I think you've probably paid for it. I, I'm sure you have uh, in, in your uh, setting. Um, 
So there's often this sense that people will think I'm not a serious Christian. People out there are going to judge me, and maybe it will hurt me in my job, and maybe it will hurt me in my role in the church, and, and sometimes it will. Uh, so those fears are not always irrational, um, and yet Jesus tells us that perfect love casts out fear, and that to work from a place of self-protection, that's not following in the path of Christ at all, is it? So I, I don't speak as somebody who has mastered that. I think I'm often quite fearful, but um, at least we have to confess that that, that sort of fear is, uh, is sinful. And that courage is a, a virtue that every human or every Christian is called to. I, I think I used to believe that only some people were called to be courageous, you know, that it was uh, like being physically strong. Some people have this quality of of courage, but some of us get to be cowardly wusses and that's okay, it's just a personality trait. But no, everybody is required to, to demonstrate yeah. courage and a part of our call to courage is being willing to do frightening things, like encounter people who are uh, different. Yeah. Rich, do you have any comments on, on that? Well, I, I agree with Laura, and I think we're all called to, called to courage. I think the call comes to different people in sure. different ways. Uh, I was once in a group with uh, the great sociologist Peter Berger mm -hmm. in my sort of uh, early days of Evangelicals for Social Justice. I, I made this comment that every Christian is called to work actively for peace and justice in the world. And Peter Berger uh, really kind of uh, brilliant uh, Lutheran uh, turned to me and said, uh, let me tell you about uh, one of my aunts who is in a, this was back, you know, 20 some years ago, one of my aunts who lives in a retirement village and she has problems controlling her bladder. And every day it takes great courage for her to decide to go out for lunch because she's afraid that she'll embarrass herself in the uh, cafeteria line. Uh, and you want her, what did you want her to do? Work actively for peace and justice in the world? Uh, she may be more courageous in her commitment to Christ than a lot of you types who are always working for peace and justice in the world. And I, I, I was chastened by that. that that's a very important thing. And so mm -hmm. sometimes uh, yeah. it's just simply uh, going over and introducing yourself to your, more, to your Muslim neighbor. Yeah. You know? uh, it, it, it may not be engaging in, in dialogue, but it might be bringing them a coffee cake or mm -hmm. asking them something about how they're doing. Uh, it, 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 courage can take different forms and for diff different people with different talents and different callings, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but but we, we need, each of us, I think, needs to think about what God is calling us to be courageous about doing as Christians. Yeah. I hear some formational language in there, right? Yeah. To, that we can ease into it in some ways, or if not, if ease into it's the wrong word, we need to be trained in some in some way and contextualized. And so, and Laura, I wanted to bring it back to you with. Um, so you you described uh, uh, you know great spiritedness, spiritedness or uh, magnanimity as the sustained, uh, disciplined love for what is good, mm -hmm. and. Um, so I want to ask, you know, how, how is that taught, right? How, how, how is a love for the good, the sustained discipline? And, and in this context, that I now have empirical evidence that children do not come into the world with a sustained and disciplined really? love for the good. <laughs> He's good and I want to know, <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how to form uh, what, it, and not just for children, of course, but, but um, how is that love formed? I think that um, most fundamentally the Holy Spirit awakens it in us, mm -hmm. right? Um, I use uh, uh, the prayer book of the uh, Church of England and every day we pray, Holy Spirit, kindle in us today the fire of your love, right? Because I don't assume that I can just love on my own. But I do think that it's a community work. And it, mm -hmm. it's something that gets passed down in community. And one of the things that Lewis is doing in The Abolition of Man is showing that every culture has some of these kinds of values that do, in fact, get passed down. 
when an entire culture uh, is in agreement that the family is at the heart of the culture, then people tend to grow up believing the family is at the heart of the culture. Um, when an entire culture believes that the um, most valuable thing you can do in your life is to lay down your life for your country, people tend to grow up believing that and then they act on that belief. So what are the beliefs that we as the church should be inculcating in our children and in each other? And they're not exactly the same values as the world around us. So for us, frankly, the family is not the heart of the community. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've kind of bought that idea of family as the heart of everything from the world around us, but no, the church, the family of God is the heart of our community and our identity as brothers and sisters together. So there are all sorts of values that are specific to us that we should be raising children up with from, from the beginning, but we need mm -hmm. to do it together. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, some of the things Mike was saying earlier about uh, uh, judgment in the church, mm -hmm. I think it's so important. I, I think we have failed as a church, as a certainly in the evangelical community. We've failed at what we think of as catechesis. Mm -hmm. And that is, it's not enough just to preach some good sermons, but there's a nurture, there's a formation that has to take place. And uh, it, it can be a very simple thing, uh, but it has to be intentional. That uh, I, I, I've been hearing a lot of Islamophobia lately, you know, mm. people, these Muslims, you know. Well, it's simply a fact. And I, I mean, I, I, I know this has been true in the past, but I'm, I'm gonna guarantee you this, that in the last month, little kids, little Muslim kids in Orange County, California, got beat up on the way home from school by kids who didn't like Muslims. Uh, there was a group of nuns right after 9-11 uh, in Orange County who went and walked Muslim kids home from school. You know. mm -hmm. That ought to be said in churches, that whatever you think about Islamic terrorism and the like, uh, it's just terrible that little Muslim kids in California get beat up because they're Muslims. And wouldn't it be wonderful uh, for Christians to stand at their side, to, to go to your Muslim mother neighbor and just say, how are your kids doing? This must be a difficult time uh, for them at school. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't take a lot, it takes courage, mm -hmm. but, but it, it, there are those opportunities. And those are the kind, the humanization of the suffering of, of Muslim children uh, is something that ought to be talked about, prayed about in churches. And, uh, and, 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 and there's a kind of catechesis in, in those things. And the kind of thing that Christina was talking about. I mean, you hear so much stupid stuff uh, being said about Ferguson and, and related issues. But to pray for, I mean, if you can't do anything else, pray for the mothers of those boys <coughs> who must be fearful and worried and, and the families of, of, of young black men who are in prison. Uh, can't we at least, uh, find some way of humanizing that and, and creating empathy. Yeah. And I think there are obvious ways in which you, you can do that that really do reach into people's hearts. Yeah, you say humanizing, uh, that simple act, of, of, so even if it's just a metaphor for ideas, but inviting someone into your home, it has a way of personalizing them and humanizing them. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, and yet I'm wondering, um, in this conversation, uh, are there lines to draw? So um, what things uh, should we uh, be more hospitable to uh, in, in, in a person and, and what should, be, should we be less hospitable to? Or is that even in a meaningful distinction? Well, I, I would say this. I mean, uh, if, if I had a chance in, say, 1942 to spend an hour with Adolf Hitler, I would not, I, I wouldn't say, hey, give me some feelings about your anger, you know, uh, toward Jews and the like. I mean, I, I think since I'm not a pacifist, I would, I would probably think about ways to kill him uh, for the horrible things that, that he was doing. There are times, and, and the dangers of civility line, uh, since I've written on that, got, got through to me tonight, but there are times that civility just is, is not enough. There are times that we simply need to go beyond uh, civility. But, but it's one thing to not, not want to uh, pay Adolf Hitler the honor of engaging him in dialogue. It's another thing to talk about how we evangelize neo-Nazi kids. 
kids that are attracted to those racist ideas, those horrible ideological themes. And uh, there I do think we, we need to try to think about uh, what, it, what it means to present Jesus Christ as the one who can respond better than Nazi ideology or Ku Klux Klan ideology to the deeper yearnings of the human spirit. Because in many ways, what racists and what Nazis uh, are longing for is to be a, in a very distorted and perverse sort of way a, a, a chosen race, <laughs> uh, a, a chosen nation. And we can say to them, boy, do we have a nation for you? Do we have a kingdom for you? Uh, that you can find a true unity in Jesus Christ and true human flourishing in Jesus Christ. And I think we need to have that kind of discernment. But there are a lot of ideas that uh, I, I, I don't know what to do with in terms of, of dialogue. Yeah. It's come up several times tonight, uh, the idea of separating a person from their ideas. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, what are some of the ways that, that you try to do that? I mean, what are there... Are there things you actually do to remind yourself? Are there ha like habits, modes of being that, that you bring to uh, conversations to remember uh, that the person before me is, just, is not just the sum total of their ideas? I find it's very helpful to pray for people. Um, if there's someone that I'm, I'm tempted to demonize, someone I'm tempted um, to just see as other who's giving me trouble, um, to, to pray God's blessing on that person, not just to pray that God will change his mind, but actually pray um, that, that God will bless and keep him, you know? Mm -hmm. um, just to keep myself remembering that this too is, is someone made by God in his image, um, no matter how upset I may be. Um, and I, I think that Voicing some of the um, the feelings that I have can also be helpful. Like I, I have a brother uh, who doesn't believe women should be ministers, and we actually get along pretty well. But one reason we get along pretty well is that we don't hide any of that from each other. Um, he's very forthright about what he thinks. I'm very forthright about what I think, and um, and then we can kind of laugh about it and move on. And uh, I think if we weren't allowed to talk about it, it would be a lot more yeah. complicated. Yeah. Lord, I, I oh, just yeah. want to say, I Please. find Psalm 139, which mm. is my favorite psalm, to be, you know, where the psalmist gets to a point where he says, Lord, I hate your enemies with a perfect hatred, mm -hmm. you know. So you and I are on the same side, God, you can count on me, I hate them too. And the very next thing he says is, Lord, search me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And I think that's, I think there's an oops in the middle of that. You know. uh, uh oh, what did I just say? Lord, search me and know my thoughts. And yeah. to me, that self-reflection uh, and looking at the person with whom I disagree and just asking the question, uh, what, what might they want to say to me on the witness stand uh, under the authority of God's word? Yeah. Laura, you, you really call, are calling for uh, more disagreement in a way, mm -hmm. that, that we need to engage in more disagreement. And um, uh, I wanted to give you a chance to sort of unwrap that a little bit, unpack it, and, and especially in light of, of um, what we commonly hear as a call to arms uh, for the church, uh, to sort of uh, pick up uh, the weapons of truth and, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then wield them in ways, engaging in a battle uh, for the yeah. truth. And I wanted to That's sort of... That's not really what I'm thinking of, no. Yeah. Um, we all stand in a particular context, right? My context is Calvin College, um, hotbed of Kuyperianism. Um, and if you don't know what that means, it's a, it's a way of thinking about um, the world that's very this world affirming. So we talk all the time about uh, Abraham Kuyper's famous saying, there is not one square inch of all creation over which Jesus Christ does not say mine. And we send our students out there to claim it, claim the world for Jesus, claim the film industry for Jesus. I think it is often a triumph. Get to the bad part now. Well, it's, oh. a, it's a triumphalistic way of thinking often. That's the dark side of it. Um, and it, it uh, often has the 
unintended consequence of making us completely assimilated because there's, there's nothing that we're going to stay away from, right? So I have students, 18 years old, who say to me, well, yeah, my 15-year-old brother or sister maybe shouldn't go to that movie, but, uh, but I can be discerning when I go. Um, and I just want to say, no. Um, the, the older I get and the more mature I get in, in Christ, the more I think there are things I just shouldn't see. There are things Jesus would prefer I not watch. Um, the more I think there should be real distinctions between the way I live and the way my non-Christian neighbors live. Not, not because um, I want to separate from my non-Christian neighbors. I still need to be in dialogue with them, but I'm supposed to be an ambassador of a different kingdom. I am, my citizenship is not here. My citizenship is in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the sun. I have already been transferred there and I should be living like that. And, and that ought to make more difference than having a fish sticker on my bumper. It, it, it ought to be a significant difference in, and I'm not saying that I do live this different life, but I'm very aware that, that I don't, that, um, that my spending patterns and that my uh, clothing choices and that uh, my entertainment options are not significantly different than lots and lots of other people of my age and class and education level all across the United States. And I don't feel as if I live a sufficiently distinctive life. Mm -hmm. I, I live with the rule of thumb that if Alyssa Wilkinson says, I can see the movie, it's okay. okay. So, yeah. <laughs> That's right. And we'll hear from Alyssa tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, okay, yeah. I shouldn't have used the movie example, sorry. <laughs> no, I, no, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. And Rich, Rich you've, you've, uh, I've heard you speak uh, about the presence of uh, a battle metaphor. Um, uh, sort of, um, and I wanted to see if you, you'd comment on that. Well, a battle metaphor uh, for waging war over ideas, so yeah. to speak. Well, I, I, I just want to say, I, I gave the Kuiper lecture at the Free University of Amsterdam last yes, week. You so. have to defend Kuiper. And, and I, I knew you would. It was a moment of repentance for me uh, on behalf of Kuiper because I wrote a chapter in one of my books called Abraham Kuiper Meet Mother Teresa uh, because Mother Teresa also believed that every square mm -hmm. inch of the creation belongs to Jesus. And she saw lepers in Calcutta as out on those square inches. And conquering those square inches meant going and and saying words of love to dying lepers in the gutters of Calcutta. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting that in a speech that, 18, uh, that Kuiper gave in 1891 that I just read in preparation for my lecture, uh, he talks about uh, going out into politics and other areas of culture in the name of the compassionate one who did not withdraw from touching leprous flesh. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I think he was a little closer to Abraham Kuyper. I think a lot of evangelicals who have picked up that kind of thing, certainly on the religious right mm -hmm. in recent years. You know, let's go out and conquer it all and right. reclaim America for Jesus and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I think uh, going out and, and listening to angry people in Ferguson and going out and whispering words of love the love of Jesus to dying lepers uh, may be the best way of claiming the square inches in his name. So, uh, I like that. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for being with us.